Thank you so much, Heather and Ron, for that warm welcome and for inviting me to participate. And a thank you to Cody, who's working behind the scenes to make sure everything goes smoothly. I'm really honored and excited to be here reading with Matthew and Jill to celebrate uh, the 40th anniversary of Alaska Quarterly Review. Um, and a big thank you to anyone who's here listening or watching and tuning in. Um, I'm going to be reading from my second book, which is Bring Down the Angels. This came out uh, in April of this year, of last year, 2020. And um, the first poem is one that came about when I was thinking about the idea of forgiveness um, and um, considering when and how and whether it's possible. Um, and I became interested in the idea of self-forgiveness as a precursor to our forgiveness towards other, other people. This one's called Phase One. For leaving the bridge open last night, I forgive you for conjuring white curtains instead of living your life. For the seedlings that wilt now in tiny pots, I forgive you. For saying no first, but yes, as an afterthought. I forgive you for hideous visions after childbirth brought on by loss of sleep. And when the baby woke repeatedly for your silent rebuke in the dark, what's your beef? I forgive you for letting vines overtake the garden, for fearing your own propensity to love, for losing again your bag and route from San Francisco, for the equally heedless drive back on the caffeine-fueled return. I forgive you for leaving windows open in rain and soaking library books again, for putting forth only revisions of yourself with punctuation worked over. Instead of the disordered truth, I forgive you. For singing mostly when the shower drowns your voice. For so admiring the drummer you failed to hear the drum. In forgotten tin cans, may forgiveness gather, cooling in gutters, gushing from pipes, a great steady rain of olives from branches relieved of cruelty and petty meanness. With it, a flurry of wings, 13 gray pigeons, ointment reserved for healers and prophets. I forgive you, I forgive you, for feeling awkward and nervous without reason, for bearing Keats's empty vessel with such calm, you worried you had perhaps no moral center at all, for treating contempt when she deserved compassion. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. For growing a capacity for love that is great, but matched only, perhaps, by your loneliness. For being unable to forgive yourself first, so you could then forgive others, and at last find a way to become the love that you want in this world. Um, the first half of the book um, deals primarily with my father's three-year battle with multiple myeloma. And um, so this next poem that I'm reading is the, pro the, the poem from which I've taken the title of the book, uh, Bring Now the Angels. And um, I'll read it now. Bring Now the Angels. Bring now the angels to test your pulse as you sleep. Bring the healer, the howler, the listening ear. Bring an apothecary to mix the tincture. We need the salve, the tablet, the capsule of the hour. Bring sword eaters and those who will swallow fire. Fetch the guardian to flatten the wheelchair to hoist it toward heaven. The public shuttle awaits the ceaseless trips to the clinic. To the bedside manner, Summons, summon witness, this medic's disdain toward patients, the physician's dismissal of pain, and call the druggist again to drug us senseless. Bring a nomad to index our debts, tuck each invoice into broken walls of regret. Call the cleric, the clerk, the messenger's divine. Summon someone, collect the prayers, buried or burnt, tied to stones, sunken seas, dunked underwater 
until all dissolves. Bring now the scribe, let it be written. There is no shepherd, no Sherpa, no moonlight guide for these, the darkest journeys of our lives. Who will lift the shuttle above the outposts of the living? Who will watch it rise and rise? Who will clear a path among all the wreckage? Who will weave a nest for all the birds of passage? Who will bridge a gap between savage and salvage? Who will sing over rough, over wilting stalks, rough husks, silk still gleaming like hair in a dream? Um, these next two poems were written um, soon after I heard the, the news about the previous administration's so-called border at our policy of, of brutally separating um, families. And so it's, it's a relief, um, you know, it's, it's not over that or ordeal, but it's a relief to at least um, talk about it uh, happening actively in the, in the past tense. Um, the first poem is called Appella. This morning, a light so full, so complete, we might ask why the God of sun is also God of plague, why the God of healing is also God of archery. The children under trees, unaware their hearts have become targets, red and inflamed as the eyes of men and thrones, find sticks in the grass to fashion into guns. Some brandish a branch saber. They are sniping the golden light with squinting faces. And everywhere they do not look, fences and more fences. There are no arrows to point the way as they scythe through a woods or dart between cars and parking lots. The miles of fence links grow more and more impassable, even as the children try to follow the voices calling them now, at first with tenderness and then with fierce intensity. This one's called The Children. How each one is taken with care from car to school doorstep, each one hand in hand with an adult. How the mothers and fathers kiss their foreheads, first pushing aside their bangs and smoothing a stray wisp. One parent straightens her daughter's velvet headband, another wipes dried oatmeal from his son's pink lips. How carefully each child is guided around the bumpers of cars. How some turn to wave goodbye one last time while others drawn to friends by an invisible cord move together first left then right with the synchronicity of fish. How even the child with tears in his lashes who cowers near a teacher knows that in a matter of hours a loved one will return to him, to return him to the facts of home. Butterfly net for trapping monarchs, foil blanket from a space museum, or the clover charms on a chain. And um, for my final poem, I am um, reading from the second half of the book, the, the last two poems I read are from the second half of the book, which brought it out from personal loss and elegy to broader um, sort of public forms of loss. And um, this is uh, the second to last poem in the book. And I should mention that um, for those of you who, have, who haven't been to Pittsburgh, in, in Pittsburgh there are um, you know, sort of big one ways or three or four lanes of traffic going one direction and then one lane going <laughs> in the opposite direction for the public buses. So I mentioned a pat bus in here, um, that's what I'm referring to. And I should probably also mention that this poem takes, the structure of the poem takes inspiration from um, the Viewmaster toy from, from my youth, which some of you may know are sort of a chunky set of binoculars. You put a slide in and click through to see the various images. Um, and now apparently there's a uh, virtual reality version of the, of the Viewmaster. Um, so this one's called Viewmaster Virtual Reality Starter Pack, Mortality Real. 
Um, and before I read it, I'd just like to say thanks again to everyone at Alaska Quarterly Review and to um, all of you who are uh, tuning in. Um, in each section, I'll just sort of call out as it goes along. One, a canyon of memory floods as the zip line slips. First bike, first dance, first kiss, broken bone, and more. First love, wedding cake, two kids. Soft spot pulsing on each newborn's crown. And you, in the blur of greenery and river and craggy rock, you release every spring pulley or counterweight that ever held you back. Two, slammed by a pat bus, mercy, swift and painless. Seven angels gasp, but you are unperturbed, descending with a steaming non-fat chai tea latte into the counterflow lane from the curb. Three, one moment you leap and dance amid a snow-topped mountain cap backdrop, and the next, without notice, you huddle in bed doting spouse dropping one perfect tear upon your furrowed brow. Somewhere afar, a sitar twang and wails, a mysterious virus. Rare injury, lightning seizing your whole and healthy spine when you least expect it. No choreography for grief. An entire troop of sequined mourners, it seems, will fail to bring you back. Four, legs crossed upon a mat in the dusty outpost, you attain such enlightenment that time slows, giving you full minutes to regard the smooth cartridge hurtling toward your chest. It makes of the air a gel, a web, a balloon stretched to snap. Welcome to bullet time. You were never so much in your life as you were around it, observing it, remarking on it. Given this moment of dead time, you can at last see from every given viewpoint. Five, overpriced vintage fountain pen pokes through your bag, piercing your backside. Infection follows and you fall to sepsis, bringing credence to claims that daily Writing involves risk. Six, pitch darkness, silence, pure emptiness, a familiar voice in the distance. Seven, the truth is you don't see it coming even there in the wrinkled bed for the sixth or is it seventh visit that season. Your beloved covers a bowl of canned peaches, the only taste nowadays that appeals. You want to save it. You plan to eat it later. You wait for your children to arrive at the bedside as they always do, exhausted and deeply happy to see you still there, still alive, bright eyed, but they know shrinking. Your face is fuller now with fluids your kidneys retain, which helps everyone forget that your legs under a stack of sheets and blankets are nearly fleshless. You know the doctors by name and they you. You know which nurses will glide in to usher each dumbstruck family member from the room hours after you've passed to the next world. Hours they've spent sobbing, wondering, and pleading. Your chest still rising and falling in rhythm endlessly, it seems, as though the only barrier between you and them for a blissful sleep of recovery, a dream of being lifted with love and carried home. Thank you.